prefer the couch or the chair? I'll, t I'll take the couch. All right. We are the last session of the day, I think. Last so. session. Yeah, you guys are hardcore, so we'll just jump right into it. Um, Chris, Disney Interactive had a wild time in social and mobile from where's my water to frozen free fall. Can you walk us through the last 12 months? Yeah, so, um, you know, we've had uh, several different iterations on our strategy. Um, you know, we have, we've had people who have said, well, we need to be like EA. And then we've had people who have said, well, no, the social mobile thing was happening, or social games, we need to be like Zynga. And 12 months ago, we sort of hit uh, reboot on the whole thing and said, let's, let's be Disney. Um, <clears throat> you know, let's run our own race. I've, I've been at Disney for 13 years. Um, you know, I love Disney. My team, you know, we, we were able to sell some of the uh, studios that were, not fo that were focused on original IP, not focused on Disney. And the folks that we have internally now making games are, uh, you know, incredibly passionate about making really authentic Disney, Star Wars, Marvel experiences. The other thing we've done is we've really embraced the, the third-party development community. So um, <clears throat> through a model we call co-development. So, um, you know, we want to work with the best creators that are out there. And uh, we're working with them where, uh, you know, folks like uh, the Frozen Freefall Studio, Genera, they make the game, they develop the game, we collaborate with them on creative, we publish the game, we market the game, we leverage our network. And so that model's worked really well for us. So we've launched, uh, we, we, we had Frozen Freefall that was already a top grossing hit uh, in mobile. We've launched two other top grossing hits over the past year, uh, Star Wars Commander uh, and Inside Out. Uh, and then we have uh, several other, if you look at the rest of our portfolio, we have around seven titles uh, seven additional titles that are top-grossing games uh, with our various IP through licensing. So, uh, you know, we're really focused right now on, on building the publishing side of our business and where we're working with licensor or licensees, we're really working with licensees who are either bigger than us from a publishing perspective or just have incredible assets and talent that we couldn't get access to otherwise. But, um, you know, that strategy of just focusing on quality and authenticity and making games that deserve to have the Disney or Star Wars or Marvel name on them has worked really well for us. So your background was actually with the Disney <clears throat> Princess franchise, right? Disney Toys, but <clears throat> one of my bigger franchises was, was Princess, yes. So in going from Princesses to more male brands like um, Star Wars and Marvel joining the Disney family, what has that really done to your strategy and how you approach the market? Well, when it comes to games, um, what, what uh, Star Wars and Marvel have allowed us to do is really go after uh, the mid-core and core audience in a stronger way. I mean, you know, almost everyone in the gaming space, <clears throat> in the core, the core gaming space and the console space is very focused on the male demographic. Disney's kind of in the, in, in the opposite situation where we've always been very strong with kids and families. We've been strong with Nintendads. Um, yeah. You know, we've been strong with, uh, with moms. <laughs> but we've never really had core and core games, and a lot of our properties just don't lend themselves to that. And oh, so, I'm good at the moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and so, uh, hello. Oh. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, uh, what we've been able to do with Star Wars and Marvel is really reach those audiences. And it, we're kind of a unique company in that we touch everyone in the family. You know, um, and one of the things I think you'll see from us in the future is trying to figure out how do we, how do we do more around the multi generational uh, component that our IP brings to the party. You know. Star Wars, a big part of its success is that it's a, it's a shared rite of passage between, you know, father and son in a lot of ways. And so that, you know, we want to start to make games. Father that and play, daughter, too. Father and daughter, too. But we want to make games that play to those dynamics, right, those multi-generational uh, dynamics. So let's talk a bit then about your audiences. So how do you know when an audience is ready for something? So we've got a Star Wars reboot coming out, a Star Wars movie franchise coming out. But how do you know that they're ready for their Black Cauldron game or their Great Mouse Detective game? <clears throat> to get a little more obscure with the Disney. Yeah, uh, well, one of the things we started to do um, is we have multi-IP games uh, that give us the ability to try stuff. Um, so- Can you give me an example? Yeah, so if you look at a game like Tsum Tsum, um, which is uh, you know, not as big in the States, but is a phenomenon in Japan and, and Asia, um, you know, that is all the Disney characters. And so uh, in a game like that, we can bring characters into it and, and see how they perform. Um, and we're finding, you know, with all of the, with all of the things that are happening in, 
performance creative, performance marketing, you know, UA, the way we're doing it, uh, you, know, B, you know, BI and our ability to measure what characters people are playing with in games. We're learning all kinds of cool things. So for example, like, um, guess which, I, I, have you seen Inside Out? No. Okay, so joy, anger, sadness, uh, uh, fear, of those characters, which would you think is the one that more people click through? The most commercial character, the character that mo most people click through to install a game of all those characters. Is and it, the main character in the movie is Joy. Is, is it sadness? It's sadness. Um, I, I have a theory behind that. I think that um, Inside Out was targeted toward people who are kind of about to go through that point in life where they're maturing. And it was a movie that spoke to people, spoke to children as though they were going to grow into adults and not grow into children. Yeah. And she's the character that transforms the most in the film. Um, you know, she's kind of the hero in a lot of ways of the film. So, you know, uh, but, but, you know, they're, they're, we're starting to create vehicles where we can test things like that and learn and then, and then use those insights to drive other games. So that's how you tell that they're ready. How do you tell that they're ready to say goodbye when it's time to sunset a game, for yeah. example? Um, <clears throat> well, one of the things that we're starting to do is try to create a model for sustaining games um, when they sort of reach the point that you can't really live op them in the traditional way. So we've set up a whole team that does that. Um, but you know, we look at the audience and we say, are you know, are people still playing this game? Is there a significant community around this? Um, you know, can we support ongoing content development? Can we do can we do a good job? There's some times where with a game, it might. Uh, make financial sense to continue to run the game, but you can't do a good job of maintaining the brand experience. And at that point, we would rather sunset the game than let the audience down. So, um, but we are trying to get better at trying to figure out how do we sort of run these games on the long tail where we provide a really satisfying experience, but we, but, and, and we continue to update content, but we maybe don't do new features and we do it with a, with a pure sustainment team, that kind of thing. Um, of games that you have had to bid goodbye to, what was the one that was kind of the hardest to let go of? Um, well, it's on the PC space, but it was Toontown. town um, You know, it had, uh, it had a pretty small audience by the time that we set, shut it down, but it's still uh, a very passionate audience. And, uh, and I still get accosted at dinner parties and barbecues <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we would love to bring back Toontown someday in some form. Um, you know, I think it's always hardest with games that kind of have that community element and Toontown really had that. Um, what about a property where there, it has a really passionate audience already and you haven't really leveraged it yet in a game? Do you have any kind of anxiety around how to connect authentically with that audience? How do you deal with that? Um, I think the biggest challenge that we have as a traditional entertainment company is that we tend to have, I mean, if you look at Pixar, for example, they have a director-driven process where the story is being created by, you know, it's a team, but it's a small group of people who own the story and then they, you know, th and, and they take incredible pride over continuity and consistency. And when you, the second you bring those those worlds into the gaming space, you give the player agency. And now they are part of the story and they're making story. And so the thing that we spend a lot of time doing is working with those creators to help identify, you know, how do we give the, how do we give the players that agency while still maintaining the things that, that, uh, that maintain the, the fiction, respect the fiction and respect the creator's vision. So it becomes a, you know, there, there's this, there's this push pull that, you know, can be a very positive thing around, you know, we're, we're starting to give the story and, and, and the IP to a certain degree to the audience and how do we welcome them into that. Um, how do you encourage people to kind of share what they're doing with your, with your creations and how they're kind of participating? Um, you know, and things, in the, when, when we were doing more MO, MMOs, um, there was a ton of emergent uh, gameplay around that. I mean, Club Penguin has, you know, hundreds of thousands of videos on, on YouTube that kids have created because it can just kind of be a little TV set for their you know, animated show that they're making. Um, but uh, you know, one of the things that we're thinking about a lot more, especially with the maker folks in the fold, is you know, the social uh, kind of net effects and, the, and, and what happens to the game outside of the game. You know, how do you build community? How do you build games in a way that uh, you allow people to share? For example, we have a game that we're gonna launch um, this week uh, that is a co-developed game with a great company called uh, Zendagi, and uh, it's called Disney Dream Treats. And uh, that game, one of the things we liked about Zendagi's engine is they allow you to take photos 
of uh, your friends and your family and bring them into the game. And the whole conceit is you're at Disneyland and you're going to the different, uh, the Disney parks and you're going to the different restaurants and uh, you're playing a match through game to feed your friends and family. And so, you know, when you get to certain levels, uh, you get a gift and the gift is this little postcard of you and Disney characters and your friends uh, you know, posed in the game and you can share it on Facebook. So we're thinking more and more about these kind of really clever things which are like, you know, how, what's the souvenir from the game and how, the social souvenir and how do, I, you know, how do I share that in a way that is interesting to other people. It's not just marketing or advertising. So on the subject of Facebook and sharing, what is something you wish that we would build to make your job easier? Um, uh, I, well, one I was thinking about just the other day is I would love to figure out how to bring Facebook Messenger uh, into our games in a deeper way, not just push into Messenger, but bring them in. I think there is something around, you know, people spend a lot of time setting up guilds and setting up, uh, you know, increasingly the social dynamics are getting, you know, uh, more and more uh, elaborate in these games. And, uh, you know, if we had a uh, having a way to extend that out into applications that people are using on a on a daily basis and not just keep that contained in the game, I think could help you know really explode the social possibilities uh, within games. So that's that's my ask. I don't, I don't have to write that down. Um, what is something? So of all the Disney games that have been on Facebook, which one was your favorite? Even if it's no longer in the lineup. Uh, well, Frozen Freefall is currently on, on Facebook, and it's doing uh, it's doing really well for us. Um, us so I'd too. have to I'd have to say <laughs> I'd have to say that one uh, is is definitely uh, definitely one of our favorites. Uh, do you think that Disney would ever do? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed I missed a huge one. I'm sorry to interrupt you. M a Marvel Adventures Alliance. Thank you. It's our biggest free to play uh, <laughs> game ever in terms of success. Uh, it is, uh, you know, still got a huge, passionate audience. You scared me there. I uh, thought you were going to no, sunset oh it or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I can't believe I blanked on that. But no, Avengers Alliance is, uh, is just a phenomenon. It continues to be a phenomenon. It continues to over-deliver what we thought uh, it could do at this stage in its life. It's three years old, uh, past three years earlier this year, and uh, that would definitely be our best uh, Facebook game. So. Yay. Um, so so oh, I actually forgot the, the transition question that I had, so this is totally not going to fit in at all. Um, do you see a consolidation in the web and mobile space? So Facebook is kind of in a weird in-between space ourselves, so we're kind of look at that, and so we're interested to see what a game developer might think of the same. Um, <clears throat> we're really focused on mobile and mobile platforms, and um, you know we're focused especially on, we're primarily a Unity shop. Um, we do do some stuff with Unreal, but you know, when, if you look at what we're trying to do, which is enable a network of developers, uh, both internally uh, and externally, you really need to be on common tools and technology because there's a lot of times that we want to share uh, code systems. The more we bring elaborate social systems and interconnections between our games, you know, we need a common platform to be able to do that on. And so, um, you know, we're, you know, we, you know, right now we're on Unity. Um, you know, I think that you're going to see at some point a resurgence in, I don't think PC gaming is dead by any standard. Um, what I do think is that, uh, you know, it's going to transition. It may not be in browser, uh, but it may be download in the app stores, um, you know. But, I mean, we've had, a, a, I say surprising, but I shouldn't say surprising, a, a good amount of success with Steam and not just... Uh, the kind of stuff that you would that you would normally think of, but uh, you know, game, Frozen Freefall uh, is on is uh, it is on Steam. Uh, we're doing, uh, you know, we brought back most of the Lucas back catalog um, and put it on Steam. It's been very successful. Um, so you know, we're seeing that as a marketplace uh, on the PC as well. That's awesome. So how does that affect your mobile strategy then going forward? Are you always going to build with that in the back of your mind? Well, I think the thing that's changing now with um, we're pretty excited about. The Apple TV, Android TV, what those devices represent. And I think what you're going to see is that these games are going to evolve into much more complex ecosystems where um, there's going to be a mobile component, there's going to be a TV component, um, there's going to be a PC component, and you're going to want to play your favorite games wherever you are, but the way you play them may be different. You know, when I'm playing on TV, I may want to play in a competitive multi multiplayer kind of, you know, sy synchronous in-room, uh, uh, you know, local kind of way. 
uh, you know, when I'm on mobile, I probably want to pay, play asynchronous against AI. So, um, you know, I think that what you're going to see is more and more games, up, up until now, most games tend to be defined by a platform. I think you're going to see games that get defined by multi-platform. And that's what we're thinking about. Us too. Um, so, pretend that you can see the future. What do you think will happen in the next 12 months in the mobile space? Um, <laughs> I think that uh, um, mobile, uh, one of the things that I think is really, f I, I don't buy into the, to, to the hooey around, you know, the mobile space is stale and stagnant and let's all move on to VR. I think that right now mobile is getting to a place where it's becoming a real business for a lot of people. So it's not interesting to the people who are, you know, funding startups, but it's, it's not as interesting as maybe it once was, but, you know, it is the largest gaming platform in the world. And now those operating systems, those technologies are going to be on your television. And one of the things that we found through research is that the primary, uh, you know, while if you look in the living room, people have got consoles, um, you know, and cable boxes, when you go into the bedroom and, you know, people have three, four TVs in their house, um, you know, those bedrooms are disproportionately connected to Roku's and Apple TVs and, 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 and Fire TVs. And so, you know, I think you are going to see uh, democratization. I think you're going to see the democratizing uh, of games on the television in the way you saw it on mobile, but it's going to be with mobile technologies and mobile platforms. And this idea of mobile to TV, I think, is going to be a big idea. And so, uh, you know, I think that the industry is only going to explode over the, over the next year, two years there. I'm excited about VR. Um, I also think that it's probably very early from a business perspective. So now is the time to be out there experimenting and learning. We're doing stuff like uh, we invested in Jaunt. ILM has got X Labs, um, which, uh, you know, if you, I've said internally, if you could think of one team that you would want to put on the, our VR stuff, it's ILM, right? <laughs> so, um, so we've got the right folks on it, but I think that is a longer play. And I think over the next 24 months, what's really going to blow up the industry is going to be um, mobile technology making it into television. All right. In our last one minute and 20 seconds, is there anything I didn't ask you that you were hoping I would ask? Yeah. So uh, uh, I have a, a, a guest here in the audience, uh, Max, one of our uh, fans from uh, Club Penguin, who's come to see me. So thank you for, uh, for coming. Where, I see where the are pointing. You You're pointing. Oh, there, there we go. go. Hey. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, he knows me as Spike Hike on Club Penguin, but Club Penguin is celebrating its 10th anniversary uh, in the next couple weeks. Um, most, there were a lot of people who copied Club Penguin, but none of them really copied the secret sauce, which is that Club Penguin creates a safe place for kids to play online, and it is still our largest community product and going strong. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an honor to, to sort of see it reach that 10 year anniversary mark and have kids like Max who are super passionate about it. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Closing remarks are coming up next, so don't bail on us.